Good evening guys and welcome back to The Criminal Spud where we explore some real life cases in a short and informal way. Now I'm going to give my spiel and I'll probably do it for every single true crime video because as I said last time true crime comes in many shapes and sizes. It's never one size fits all so please be aware that some of the content covered in these videos may be upsetting or even downright disturbing. And as well, sometimes we're just not in the headspace and that's okay. So if this is not the kind of content for you today, go ahead and press skip. But stop off and check out my main channel, The Sofa Spud Reviews, for something lighter and much less stabby. So if you do enjoy the content, go ahead and let me know by liking and subscribing so that I know whether or not to keep making these videos. Today's case is actually one that I came across a few months ago and I reckon that I blocked it out of my memory because... It's a very upsetting and infuriating case. And then it popped back up on my radar this week when I was scrolling on my commute to work. And I just knew the minute I saw her face again, I knew this was gonna be our case of the week. So please be warned, this one is not pleasant. It does involve the horrific neglect and physical abuse of a beautiful little boy called Jordan who was only five years old when he lost his life. And the exact circumstances around his cause of death still to this day remains unclear. Now we have information but the reason that I say it remains unclear is because the information we do have we got from his piece of shit mother. So it's whatever she's decided to divulge. And let's just say she's not a very credible source, which you're going to see as this story unfolds. So buckle up. This is the case of Jordan Rodriguez. So we're going to rewind back to 2017. And this time we're going to Cleveland, Ohio. And it's the week before Christmas. There's snow on the ground. Houses all have their fairy lights up. There's trees in the window. And I remember this kind of time of the year when I was a kid. It was electric. And we didn't have a lot. Like we had fuck all money when I was little. But it didn't matter. It was still the best time of the year. You would see family that you didn't see as often. There was like loads of junk food in the house that we wouldn't have had all year round. All the best movies were on TV. My particular favourite was The Muppets Christmas Carol. That to this day is my number one. And of course the elephant in the room. Santa was on the way. So you were on best behaviour because you know as your mum reminded you. Don't be a little asshole or you're going to get a lump of coal at Christmas. And that was like a double salt in the wound because we didn't have a fireplace. So what was I even going to do with coal? So yeah, it was just, there was something magical about that time of year as a kid, whether you had money or not. But things were not so magical in the Rodriguez household. So Larissa Rodriguez was 34 at this time. She had nine children with nine different men and she was prego with lucky number 10. Now you're probably wondering... 10? What? 10 kids in one house? Well, she only had custody of five of them by this point. So, you know, every cloud. But her current baby daddy-to-be was Christopher Rodriguez. Now, same name, not legally married. Just to point that out. Christopher was 36 and he had a kid of his own that he didn't really see or support all that much. And in fact, he was in, at this particular point in time, he was locked up in Medina County for child support arrears. So charming, I know. And the house that Larissa was in the kids with was a kip. It was filthy. There was bug infestations. There was a rat problem. There wasn't a whole lot of food either. Like the kids lived on the bare minimum, just the basics. And I, I really mean the bare minimum. Most of the time they just went hungry. And that's because Larissa squandered most of her cash on her embarrassment of a man-child boyfriend. She put money on his commissary account and drove to and from the jail. So she like spent shitloads of money on petrol. She spent loads of money on cell phone bills because she had to be in contact with him, you know, every chance that she got. And the little money that she did have wasn't cutting it for this jackass and this horrible relationship. So she was actually selling her food stamps. Yeah, she was selling the food stamps that the government gave her to feed her nine children and herself. And she was selling them for 50 cents on the dollar. So this was kind of like the scam she was running. And it freed up a bit of cash for Christopher. And I've listened to hours of their phone calls during this time when he was in jail because they're all online. And trust me, save yourself the time. They are absolutely mortifying. He literally hounds her for money. He's pressuring her to get other people to put money on his books or put their credit card number down so he can buy himself a pizza. Like they have pizza. Yeah, they have pizza in jail. 
and coffee for one of the other inmates as like a payment for tattooing him. And the calls are just, they're sickening. He love bombs her. It is so cringy. And then between the, I love you, baby. You're the best baby. You're the only baby. It's like, can I get some money there, baby? And yeah, the co- the phone calls as well, by the way, the, the cost of speaking to each other on the phone is $10 a day. $10 a day. Like that is 70 quid a week. And the kids, meanwhile, are starving, but no big deal. Christopher needs soda. And it's just crazy, isn't it? Because he's in jail for being a deadbeat who can't support his one child. Yet here he is, bleeding this dumbass Larissa Dry, having her sell food stamps instead of feeding her children. Like, And he was 100% eating better in prison than her kids were at home, which infuriating. Just like I said, this case is infuriating. So that's a bit of a background on this household and who lives there. Now, the Cleveland police receive a call on the 17th of December from a man called Scott. And it's a very long distance call because Scott is in the military and he's currently serving in Pakistan. So yeah, if you're getting a long distance call from Pakistan from an active serving member of the military, it's probably important. And Scott's been up all night. He can't think straight because he's been told some very troubling things by his brother, Christopher. Mm -hmm. And although the things seemed really outlandish and far-fetched, and Scott isn't even entirely sure that he believes his brother, he still feels the need to report this because he hasn't been able to shrug it off. He couldn't live with himself if there was any truth to it. And he needs to to get it off his conscience. So apparently when Christopher was speaking to Scott, he wasn't in a great frame of mind. He was feeling very low. He's in jail, remember. He was distressed and depressed and all of the things. And he got very, very emotional. And in a moment of emotion, Christopher confides in Scott that he helped Larissa, his girlfriend, bury one of her children in the backyard. Yes, you heard that correctly. Christopher is admitting to his brother, Scott, that he assisted his shithead girlfriend in burying the body of a dead child in their garden. So just take a minute to let that sink in. And could you imagine being the person in that police station who was on the phones that day? Like it's December 17th. You've probably spent your entire day getting calls about drunken disputes, burglaries, the odd shoplifting debacle, multiple calls probably from whiny Edna about the neighbour's Christmas lights being on her side of the fence again. And then this comes through. Like, I would be thinking, is this a wind up? Is this one of my friends trying to pull my leg? What am I actually being told right now? But no, it wasn't a wind up. And Scott doesn't have a lot more information than that. He says that his brother Christopher you know, swears blind that he did not murder this child, but he did help bury the body of this child. He didn't really give much information into what happened, but Scott knows that the kid was approximately four or five years old and that the kid's name was Jordan Rodriguez. So first thing the next morning, two officers are dispatched to the home to do a wellness check. And it takes them a good three attempts banging quite loudly on the door before Larissa sleepily opens up and invites them inside. They tell her, look, we've been asked to do a wellness check on the kids. And you know what? For someone who knows that she has got the body of a dead child in her back garden, she's pretty nonchalant. I have to give it to her. And she just kind of goes, yeah, all my kids are fine. They're upstairs. You can hear them. So the officers say, well, can can we see them? So she says, yeah, sure. And she leads them up the stairs. You can actually see already that the house is filthy. But she leads them up the stairs and she kind of opens the door to one of the bedrooms. And sure enough, there's four kids in there awake. And the officer kind of waves to them, says, you know, hi, kids. And they go back downstairs. So Larissa and the two officers are now standing at the bottom of the stairs in the home. And the officers are asking her some basic questions. You know, how many children do you have? How many live here with you? And so on and so forth. And Larissa, you know, she's kind of giving really vague half answers. She does tell them, I have nine kids and five of them live here with me. But she remains quite guarded. She's trying to assess the situation and size of the officers. She's trying to figure out what it is that has, you know, brought them to her door this morning. And can we just say, you're a scumbag if you've 
hurt a child you're a scumbag 10,000 times over if you have actually caused a child's death and then buried them in the back garden but you really need to be some special kind of scumbag when you have a body buried in your back garden and police show up to your door and you're not 100% sure that that's the reason that they're here like that says it all but all doubt leaves her mind very quickly because the officer asks you know you five kids living here with you there's four of them here right now do you have a son about four or five years old? And she says, oh, Anthony. And they're like, no. Do you have a son with special needs? And did I mention already that Jordan has special needs? Just in case, you know, this wasn't going to be a disgusting enough story. But Jordan was actually born with one kidney and he's completely non-verbal. And he had developmental issues from birth. So, you know, if you were worried that he wasn't quite vulnerable enough as a little five-year-old boy, yeah, it just gets worse really, doesn't it? And the penny has now dropped as to why these officers are here. And Larissa says, oh, you're talking about Jordan. Jordan's not with us. And then she catches herself and says, right now, Jordan's not with us right now. He's actually visiting with his biological dad. So he's in Texas and he'll be there for the whole holidays and he's been there for a few weeks. And she's that dumb that she didn't anticipate there being any follow-up questions. So when the police ask her, well, we're going to need a phone number for Jordan's dad. You know, we need a way to get in touch because we really need to verify all of this. She says she doesn't know what his number is. She has no real way of contacting him, but she can try and reach out to some people and figure out if he has a a working phone number at the moment because, you know, his last number got cut off. I mean, bullshit. It's like something people tell Judge Judy, I swear to God. And not only does Larissa not know the phone number for Jordan's dad, she's also trying to say that she doesn't know his last name. She had a child with this man, but she doesn't know what his last name is despite the fact that she's saying they were together for two years. And as the topic of Jordan starts to come up, we notice at the top of the stairs behind Larissa, two of the kids from the bedroom have made their way out and they're doing what kids do and they sit on the top of the stairs and they're quiet and they're listening and they're very interested in what is going on right now. And there's a point where Larissa is kind of bent over a little phone table and she's writing down a list for the officers of all of her, her kids' names and their date of birth. And the smaller child, her name is Tatty, and she's really just like sizing up this officer. And he waves to her to kind of let her know, it's okay, you know, I'm not scary, I'm not a threat, I'm friendly. And when he does this, she starts chattering. Now she's teeny tiny and she can barely talk you know the way like a little toddler kind of has some words but even when they are stringing together sentences it's not always easy to understand what they're mumbling about but then we hear clear as day the little tiny toddler say mommy beat me up now if you're unsure when you watch this body cam footage of what you just heard she says it again mommy beat me up and Mimi too. And then she keeps saying, and Mimi too, and Mimi too. Mimi is her sister, just in case anyone is wondering. And Larissa keeps cool as a cucumber and she can clearly hear behind her what this kid is saying. She shrugs it off. She kind of laughs as in like, okay, you know, settle down now. And just like dismissing it. And the officer, to be fair to him, he nearly rolls with this. He has very obviously clocked what that child is saying and he continues on then just talking to Larissa as though you know no big deal because he doesn't want to raise suspicion he doesn't want to tip her off that he knows exactly what the hell is going on in this house he wants to keep her on side to try and get as much information as possible out of her so for a quick minute he kind of changes the subject and pivots over to Christopher just to kind of let Larissa know you know I'm moving off the subject of the kids so you can relax so Larissa's chatting away about Christopher and the fact that he's you know upstate in jail and then it comes back to Jordan again and the officer kind of says you know, I'd really love it if I could get in touch with Jordan if there was any way. And she's asking him, well, maybe if you leave a number with me, I can figure out a way to get in touch and then I can get back to you. And as this subject of Jordan comes back up, the bigger child that is sitting on the stairs scoots their way right down to almost the bottom of the stairs, 
right next to this big window that looks out over the side of the property. And when Larissa is not looking and the officer is in view of him, the child points out the window onto the garden at the side of the house. And when I saw that for the first time, my blood ran cold. It was so chilling. And I've watched this body cam footage over and over so many times. And every time I watch it, it, it's so much clearer what the children are telling these officers. And it's so upsetting. It's so infuriating because you're thinking, holy shit, like what have these kids been seeing? What have they been experiencing? What has been their life under this roof for God knows how long? And the officer doesn't miss a beat. He leaves his colleague talking to Larissa and he very subtly but immediately removes himself. He walks back out the front door and he kind of, you know, subtly moseys down the garden path and around the side, trying to get a little bit of a look down the side, again, without arousing much suspicion. But like I mentioned in the start, you know, time of year as well, there was snow on the ground. So, It would have been a bit harder without physically going out and excavating to be able to gauge if there was any kind of fresh burials. I know that it feels weird even saying that, but look, there was more than enough there to issue the warrant and Larissa was taken into custody the very next day and the back garden was excavated and this is where they actually did recover Jordan's body. And this frail little five-year-old frame was found wrapped in multiple blankets with mothballs in them, which is like kind of a pesticide thing that wards off little critters and creatures. So it was a clear attempt to keep animals off the scent so that they didn't try to dig up that area. And they had, for some reason, a diaper placed over Jordan's head and face. Again, probably to try and ward off the scent. And when they performed the post-mortem, they discovered that he was severely malnourished. I mean, are we surprised? Of course, he was severely malnourished. She spent all of the kids' food money on calls to prison and she traded their food stamps for 50 cent on the dollar so that she could send money to her scumbag boyfriend so that he could have pizza while he sat in jail. So yeah, we're not surprised that Jordan was malnourished. But they also found multiple fractures his wrist had been fractured and his ribs had been fractured but they were not fresh fractures they had been done long before he passed and they had been done all at different times and they were at different stages of healing and they were self-healing and I could not imagine at 34 years of age how painful that would be if I broke my wrist and I didn't go to like the swift care or the emergency room or to a doctor or have any painkillers like you'd go into shock I can't imagine the suffering that this tiny little kid was going through and ribs every breath that he took would have been literal agony and remember Jordan was completely 100% non-verbal he couldn't articulate what he was feeling he couldn't speak he couldn't communicate so he was just trapped in his own mind in extreme pain and probably terrified out of his wits because there is a grown ass man beating the shit out of him. And I'll put up the picture of Christopher Rodriguez who is kind of purported to have done the majority of this abuse. Look at the size of this asshole. And now think of a malnourished five-year-old boy with special needs. He's just a dickless fucking coward, isn't he? And another thing, you know, on foot of this arrest of Larissa and the excavation of the back garden, a team of social workers had to like swoop in because we're talking like the 19th of December at this point when Larissa is arrested and there's still four children in that house. Christopher is off in jail already. So they had to literally find homes for these four kids to spend Christmas in. I Like how messed up is that? So they split the four siblings into two groups of two so that they would at least have one familiar person with them. Like these kids were still extremely young. Like Anthony was only four years old. And the investigators and the social workers, they basically decided to just table this for the kids until after the holidays. They wanted to try and allow them have 
as much of a normal Christmas as possible. And that sounds absolutely nonsensical to say, doesn't it? Because they've just been taken from their home. Their mother's gone to jail. They don't have anybody or anything familiar around them. They're suddenly in this foster home and they still don't understand what's happened to Jordan. Some of them clearly do. The older ones clearly know what has happened because even if they didn't witness this, which I truly hope that they didn't, they most likely have overheard conversations between Chris and Larissa. So it is clear that at least one of the children, the one who pointed out that window, is in the know about what is going on and what has happened to Jordan. And when these social workers were at first deployed to this home to basically take you know, custody of the kids, they were in shock at the conditions that the kids were living in, like the filth of the house. There were cockroaches in the kitchen. It was like something out of the Adams family. And it actually turns out that these are not the first social workers that have come into this house. I mean, are we surprised? Not really. Larissa only had custody of half of her children at this point. There was in fact 13 different investigations undertaken on the Rodriguez household between 1999 and 2017. That's 19 years. Larissa Rodriguez was on their radar for 19 years for being a shitty parent. And if you're wondering, you know, well, where were all the social workers? Did they not have one for the last couple of years? How could this have possibly fallen through the cracks? Well, you might want to take a deep breath because this is going to piss you off because it pissed me off. They did have a social worker. There was a social worker assigned to this house for the last couple of years and she was a social worker assigned at the time of Jordan's death and her name was Nancy Caraballo. And do you remember earlier on in the video I had mentioned that Larissa was trying to send all of her money to Christopher in prison and it just it still wasn't enough so she was selling her food stamps for 50 cents on the dollar to free up more cash to support Christopher while he rotted in jail. Yeah well Nancy the social worker was the one who was buying the food stamps from Larissa for 50 cents on the dollar and then going down and paying for her weekly grocery shopping out of these discounted food stamps. I am not shitting you. And was she at least still doing monthly checks? Of course she wasn't doing monthly checks. She was only showing up to the house to collect her food stamps. And she would just make these fictional logs and write down, you know, what her observations were each visit. But she wasn't even going into the house. Like, her reports were just Mickey Mouse bullshit reports. So, yeah, it all went under the radar because Nancy was a massive piece of shit. And as... Larissa's kids went hungry and Jordan's malnourished dead body lay in the dirt out the back garden. Nancy was kicking her feet up and watching the telly and thinking, great, I got my weekly grocery shop for half the price. What an asshole. But don't worry, she doesn't get a happy ending. She got three years in prison for this little stunt. And that's all I'm even going to say about Nancy because I could probably do three hours talking about social workers who fail children in true crime stories that I have seen and it will keep you awake at night. So fuck Nancy, but let's get back to Larissa. So she is being questioned by the police. She's kind of, I say, confessing with an asterisk on the end because it's not really a true confession when you're going out of your way to shift blame onto somebody else. So the version we get from Larissa is questionable at best, but it's all that we really have to go on. She states that at some point in September, Christopher came into her room and he was carrying Jordan's body. And Jordan was alive at this time, but he was really weak. His body was limp. He was barely conscious. And it was very clear to both of them that the situation was quite serious. And instead of calling 911, they just put him in a cold shower. They tried to revive him a little bit. And when that didn't work, they just put him in bed and they let him stay in bed for like 24 hours. Now, there is no way that they did not realise that he needed medical attention. But I think that they were that selfish that they knew if they brought him into a hospital, there would be consequences because they were going to see other signs of abuse. They weren't going to be able to just say, listen, we found our child unresponsive and he's got some birth defects, he's got one kidney, so please help us. No, they were more worried about protecting their own hides. And even when the worst happened and they realised that Jordan had passed away, 
that still wasn't enough to shake them and make them call 911. They still were in pure self-preservation mode. They basically thought nobody would notice. I mean, we'll just put this dead child in this hole in the dirt and go back to normal life and nobody will ask questions. He won't be missed. And do you know what the worst part is? They were partially right for a very long time. It was three months before anyone came looking for Jordan. And the only reason it was discovered in December was because Christopher had blabbed and told his brother about this. And the brother picked up the phone and rang the police. If the brother hadn't have picked up that phone, who knows if we would have ever realised that Jordan wasn't off staying in Texas with his dad. Because the social worker that was coming to check on the children was just writing fake reports, taking their food stamps and saying, pleasure doing business with you, see you again next month. I mean, so many levels of rage go through my body when I think about this case. So we get that, you know, version of what happened from Larissa and the detectives are talking to her and they're trying to get more insight into what the hell has been going on in this household. And Larissa is just on victim mode she's talking about how she had such a hard childhood and because of that she's so soft she's not the kind of mother who would ever you know hit her kids or be tough on her kids if anything she's too soft on her kids and her kids walk all over her and then she says that Chris is you know quite aggressive that Chris beats her and he's rough with her and he gets pissed off at her because she's just so soft with her kids and she defends her kids too much. So she completely almost turns on Chris and paints him as this monster very quickly. She describes him as violent, as aggressive, that he's anger issues, he's jealous because, you know, people tell her online that she's pretty. He punishes the kids very harshly. He's physical with the kids. He hits them. But she says that more than anyone else in the household, Jordan kind of bore the brunt of Christopher's attacks. She said that Christopher was so much worse with Jordan than any of the other kids that he really just zoned in on him and picked on him and she never understood why. And I could probably tell her why. It's because he was the vulnerable one. He was non-verbal. He couldn't say anything. And this Christopher asshole was a bully. And do you know something? As she sat there painting herself as this victim along with the children who was just so afraid of Christopher... I'm going to call bullshit on that because do you remember at the beginning of the video when I was saying that I had sat through hours of their jail calls and it was cringe and it was just, yeah, it was mortifying and he was hounding her for money and they were, I love you, baby. I love you, baby. Put money on my books. Yeah, I would now like to <laughs> highlight two things. Number one, these conversations were after Jordan had been buried in the back garden because Jordan passed away and was buried in September. And Christopher went to jail for the child support arrears in October. So the hours of conversations that we have available to us to listen to them be lovey-dovey with each other. And Christopher tried to scam her out of more money and ask her how much she made from Nancy on food stamps this month. That was all after Jordan had been put down into the ground. So that's number one. And number two, when they are talking on the phone, you can hear in the background, you know, on Larissa's side, the other kids kind of shouting, making a ruckus, fighting with each other, as you would imagine a house full of toddlers would sound like. And Christopher is going nuts on the other end of the phone. He is telling Larissa, tell that kid I'm going to punch him in his mouth. Tell that kid I'm going to sort him out when I get home from here. And then he's instructing Larissa to tell one of the older siblings to go and punch one of the younger siblings. And he's saying, do it, tell him to do it, tell him to do it right now, right now, punch him in the mouth. And Larissa is passing this message on and she's doing it without hesitation. She's doing it quite enthusiastically. And if you listen to these calls, this is not a woman who is afraid of Christopher. This is not a woman who's afraid of any kind of confrontation. She's not this, you know, wilting flower. She's telling Christopher, I saw your ex today outside the courthouse and it took everything in my body not to beat the shit out of her and end up in jail myself. These are two aggressive assholes that have found each other and the children have suffered as a result. So sitting and listening to Larissa's attempts to make herself, you know, seem like this really weak, feeble victim is laughable. 
And without accusing Christopher of actually murdering Jordan, she kind of implies it. She says that I just had a feeling that he had something to do with it. I have a feeling that he's the reason that Jordan died. I just, in my bones as a mother, I feel like Christopher did something. You know, I just feel it. And she talks about Jordan's dying moments, his last breath. And again, Jordan is nonverbal. She talks about how Jordan looked into her eyes and it was almost as though he looked angry and he was trying to communicate something to her. And she says... I thought he was almost trying to cuss me out but then I realised he was just trying to tell me that he loved me and I mean if that doesn't turn your stomach nothing will. It honestly seems like Larissa in this interrogation thinks that she's nailing it that she's doing a really good job of convincing these detectives particularly the female detective you know that she's kind of a victim as well. And she's she's guilty of just being too good a mother, if anything. I mean, she was such a soft mother who only wanted the best for her kids. And there's just there's so much contradiction because she's trying to peddle that narrative that she's this great mother and she just, she and her kids are so connected. But the investigator actually has to ask her at one point, do you want any updates on your kids? Like, do you want to know where they are? Like, what the status is? Like, have they been taken into care? Like, it's almost as if the investigators have to prompt her to ask about her other four children. And they let her know that they're, you know, in homes for Christmas, that they've been split up into the two and two, and that they're not going to be questioned or brought in to the police station until after the holidays. And at this point, Larissa says, you know, can you get a message to my daughter? Let her know that mommy was honest and that, you know, let her know, make sure that she understands that she doesn't need to say anything. If she doesn't want to talk, she doesn't have to talk. You know, can you make sure you tell my baby that? And it's just, it makes your skin crawl. She is so transparent. At one point also, in addition to blaming Christopher for all of this, at one point she tries to imply that there was something supernatural at play in this house like I'm not joking she full-on tries to use the Amityville horror defense and she references a murder that took place years ago you know amongst previous owners and that she had heard about this when she was moving in and she always noticed that there was a strange feeling in this house that there was some kind of a spiritual presence and Jordan started to act really weird since they've been living in this house she says it's you know it's so odd like he rocks back and forward all the time and we just we just don't know why it must be this spirit and the female investigator that is questioning her at the time actually has to say yeah that sometimes is typical of children with autism it's a way that they self-soothe and Larissa's like oh really I didn't know that but she still continues with this whole Amityville horror type ghost excuse and she says you know actually I feel like this this female spirit yeah it's a female spirit too not just a spirit this female spirit also got into Chris's head because something told him to log into my Facebook account and he saw these messages from, you know, just a friend and it was flirty and he got really jealous and really angry and only for that spirit, you know, told him that he, he should go look in my Facebook. And I'm sitting going, is this real life? Like, is this girl actually having a giraffe here? But you know, she's so enthusiastic about the, the theory that there's a spirit in the house. Something that she's not enthusiastic about during this questioning is the suggestion that one of her older daughters has experienced some sexually inappropriate behaviour from Christopher. And when this is put to her, Larissa gets quite defensive and quite dismissive. And she just flat out says, no, no, that's not true. That's never happened. She's always with me. No. And they're like, well, you know, maybe she doesn't feel comfortable to talk to you about it. And maybe it is the case that, you know, some things have happened that you're not aware of. And she's just saying, well, no, she's never been alone with him. I never leave my daughter alone with him. Every time I leave the house, she wants to come with me. She never wants to be left behind. And she's never liked him. She never bonds with males at all. <laughs> like... Is that not telling you something? And the investigators say to Larissa, you know, there is a chance that this guy is a sexual predator and he preys on children and he's taking advantage of you for your money and living in your house 
and getting access to your kids. And she kind of says very nonchalantly, well, I mean, could you look into that maybe? I don't believe it happened, but who knows? She actually says the words, who knows? We're talking about her daughter potentially being molested by her boyfriend, the same boyfriend who she thinks killed her son. And I would like to mention at this point that the whole time that Larissa is in custody and Christopher, he's off in his own jail, they're still writing to each other back and forth. And if you think maybe they're talking about the trial and what's to come, maybe they're discussing the events or maybe they're trying to get a story straight. No, they're mostly just sexually frustrated and they want to talk to each other and tell each other, you know, how much they miss each other and they love each other and how they can't wait to get married someday and start their new life and, you know, leave all the bad stuff behind. Yeah, zero remorse, zero fucks given, absolutely no regard for the deeds that they have done. And they do try, you know, in the beginning, they're going to go ahead and go to trial, but they eventually cave and they plead guilty and they are sentenced for involuntary manslaughter, amongst other things. There's a lot of other things thrown in there. And Christopher gets 28 years and Larissa gets 25 years. I think that they thought that pleading guilty would reduce the time that they were going to get. But actually the judge that was handing down the sentence was so disturbed and disgusted by what these two had done and the lack of remorse that they had shown that she gave them the maximum sentences and not only that she actually broke down in tears as she handed down these sentences because she was that horrified by what these people had done to that child and I don't recall ever seeing a judge get this emotional and I understand because I can't say that if I had been in her shoes I would have been any different. It's just that you're so used to seeing judges be so stoic and it is like, it's not ever nice to see somebody upset, but it is nice to know that there are people in the system, the justice system, I mean, that, you know, have their humanity about them and still truly empathise with the victims. Now, I'm going to play you just a clip of the judge. I'm not sure if the sound quality is going to be great because there's so much background noise in the courtroom, but Again, I will put the link in the description to this video as well. And the same to the state. And to the defense, this is equally difficult for you. What we do every day is so hard. People don't give any of us the credit that we deserve for dealing with the horrors that are brought before us. And Mr. Rodriguez, this is a horror. I know as a judge, I'm not supposed to show emotion. And in 22 years, I never have. This is one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. And I don't understand, Mr. Rodriguez, why you don't want to cleanse yourself and tell the truth about what happened here. And I hope someday you do. Whatever this child's life was supposed to be, you made sure it didn't happen. You and Larissa, I look at friends and family, people who are desperate to have children and want to have families, and you two have babies with no consideration. You just keep having them, having them, disregarding the value of their life, disregarding their purpose in life, like they're less than an object, no regard. I didn't even hear you say you were sorry. I will not accept the recommendation for Mr. Rodriguez. These crimes are horrific. There's no question in my mind that this child was abused. It's clear that you did everything you could, you and Larissa, to hide evidence to protect yourselves. You had every opportunity at so many points to make a difference to get help, to stop beating somebody, to call the police, to ask for help, to try to take him to the hospital. I have to imagine that at some point you got on the internet and said, how do I bury a body? Because this is unbelievable to me. 
the level of meticulousness that you went through to not be discovered. I honestly don't know how you live with yourself. I, I don't know how either one of you live with yourself. The court imposed a sentence as follows. Count... And then from that point on, it's just her listing all the different charges and all the various sentences that she imposes. But yeah, I mean, go judge. And she makes such a good point. There's so many people out there who desperately want to have a family and they're not able to. And they would probably provide a wonderful home and a stable life for a child. And then you get people like Larissa Rodriguez and Christopher Rodriguez. I mean, it is sometimes very tough to to square that I think and in case anyone was wondering yes Larissa did give birth to her 10th child behind bars and this child was named Aaliyah and she was taken obviously into foster care and Larissa said to Christopher in one of her many love letters because yes they continued writing back and forth to each other even after they were sentenced to 25 and 28 years respectively she tells Christopher that Aaliyah being taken into foster care and taken away from her was the worst feeling that she could ever imagine. I mean, it's not like she watched her own abused child die in her arms and then buried him in the back garden. But I mean, yeah, having her child taken into foster care, that's that's the worst thing that she could ever imagine. And there are so many other aspects to this case, so many other tiny little details and other witness accounts that I've kind of left out of this because I just wanted to give the overview of the case. I do want to keep these quite informal and quite short and it is the, the content of this particular case is very heavy. Anything to do with child abuse I find very difficult to digest so it is best to probably take it in little bits but if you do find that this is a case that you're interested in learning more about I would implore you to go and look it up. I'm going to put in the description a link to the body cam footage. I'm going to also put up a link to Larissa's interrogation and the rest I'm sure that you've no you've no issues navigating YouTube. You'll be able to find whatever you need to find but yeah there probably are some family members and I'm not talking about Scott who actually blew the whistle on this. I'm talking about one sister of Larissa's in particular that I do kind of feel could have done something, she could have probably intervened, but I've left her out of this. I'm not going to go there because I do acknowledge that you are not guilty for the crimes of your close family and you shouldn't bear that mark your whole life. But at the same time, I do feel like some things are quite straightforward and some things are a no-brainer and you just fucking intervene. But anyway, I'm not going to go there because I've already been too cursy and self-righteous. So, I apologise for that. But that was the case of Jordan Rodriguez and I will be back again late in the weekend, probably Sunday night, because I have another doozy of a case that I am going to share. It is a very well-known case here in Ireland. I don't know if it will be well-known outside of Ireland, but again, it's another heavy one. So viewer discretion will be advised and I'll remind you of that at the beginning of our next video. But thank you for joining me, guys. I hope you all have a pleasant evening. I will chat to you soon. Take care.